Hey, everybody. Hey, thank you all for um, joining us with uh, the Paul Hobbs Imports uh, tasting we're doing tonight. I am Nate Norfolk, uh, the Wine and Spirits Director here at Ray's Wine and Spirits. And um, I haven't been able to get in touch with Dan, who is the master son uh, who's going to help us out today and be live. I, I apologize. I've been reaching out to him for like the last hour plus and just I, I don't know what's going on. So um, we're living in crazy times, folks. So you're stuck with me. Um, I'm relatively familiar with the, the regions where these wines are from and we'll walk through them and taste them together. I, uh, you, you know, the story of Paul Hobbs himself, who, who really is behind all these wines is, um, is compelling. And he was a New York state, um, you know, he was born in New York state and, you know, started his winemaking career in California in the 1980s and uh, really rose to prominence and uh, had wines that scored 100 points with the wine advocate and wine spectator and um, really started to do an import company like in the last 20 years he's been, been what you know folks refer to as a flying winemaker and is uh, all over the you know has traveled the world really starting out mostly he was somebody who really adopted and uh, recognized the quality in uh, the wines of Argentina very early on um, and their quality and, and potential in the global market for wine. And he became kind of the the American Malbec master, meaning like he, he um, you know, had his own label in Argentina well before many other folks in the U.S. were investing in wines from there. Um, and we'll, we'll t and then subsequently now in uh, the, you know, early 21st century, he also got involved with in 2011 in this uh, Crocus project, which is in Cahors in France and a Malbec based wine there. Um, what I can hear you, but don't see any video. Should we be seeing anything? Do you want to try that? Uh, oh, do you want to check this out, Eric? Yeah. Oh, yep. Got it. Thanks. Um, yeah, if any, is everybody having, if anybody else is having any visual difficulties, let me know. All right. I think that's Chris out there. Yeah. Um, nonetheless, uh, sorry that Dan's not making it and, um, we're gonna, we're gonna walk through this. He made a great PowerPoint with me for me though. So, <laughs> so a big thing that we're gonna review. I want folks to try. We're gonna try the wines in this order. We're gonna actually have the wine from the Arini, the Jacobian Hobbs Arini from Armenia. That's gonna be the first thing we do, right? It's gonna be wine number one, and then we're gonna do the. Uh, uh, crocus wine from uh, Caor in southern south kind of southwestern France really um, and then we'll do the Brimare which is from Argentina um, and I mean I'm sure everybody's just drinking these already <laughs> right <laughs> I know I would be <laughs> I mean it's like this isn't a movie there's not, we're not doing it. It's like, you, you, you got to hit this stuff and hopefully you got some food too. Um, what's up, Grace and Mark? Woo, woo. Um, thank you. Blessings. Wonderful. It looks like the visual thing's good. So in a nutshell, um, you know, we're going to kind of, this is fun because this is a kind of new world, old world tasting. And we're going to really see two very different expressions of Malbec. But first, what we're going to go into is um, we're going to get like we're going to try these wines from from um, well, I'll, we're going to try the wine from Armenia. But we're going to kind of I'll give you a brief review of what all is going on with Paul Hobbs. So he's 
his wine, he has, has um, you know, a winery in Coombsville in Napa Valley, and then Caor, which is in southwestern France, you know, Mendoza in Argentina, the Russian River Valley, where he's making Pinot Noir and Chardonnay under a couple labels, including, you know, the eponymous Paul Hobbs and then Cross Barn, and uh, Vyats Zor, which is in, uh, in Armenia, and uh, Riviera Sacra, which is um, in the northwestern part of Spain in a really amazing kind of dramatic landscape where a grape called Mencia is. And he has a recent project in Seneca Lake in uh, um, the Finger Lakes area of New York. Um, man, I'm, I'm doing my best here, folks. But the Jacobian uh, Hobbs wine, this is Arini, which is an indigenous grape to uh, Armenia and is a really, really old, uh, one of the first vinifera grapes, you can see that Armenia is an incredibly dramatic landscape. And I believe this is Mount Ararat in the background here. Um, the Jacobian family are of Armenian origin, but I believe live in Lebanon now. Um, here. We got some good maps because it's all about the good, good maps, okay? So if we're looking here, um, you know, Armenia is really sandwiched in between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, and it's roughly on, you know, the same uh, – this it's at the same latitude that, that basically it's a little bit south of where we would be, but um, – smack dab in the Caucasus and, you know, bordered by Georgia, Azerbaijan, Iran, and Turkey. And man, there's some, there's some acrimony between them and Turkey. That's a whole other thing. Um, nonetheless, this is like a really, you know, the, the country has a very, very old uh, Christian tradition. And um, subsequently there's, you know, winemaking has been part of, um, uh, you know, predates even that, but, but, you know, they adopted Christianity in the third, the fourth century, 301 AD. Um, and, you know, we're dealing with a country that's smaller than Maryland and there's about 3 million people. So it's half, you know, half the population of Wisconsin here. Um, folks drink a ton of vodka here and not much wine. And that's changing a little bit. Um, Vayetz Zor. See, we're dealing with a mountainous landscape that's in the foothills of the Caucasus. And the beauty of this is that this, this actual region where we're going to uh, – has there were – they recently, about 10 years ago, found um, signs of viticulture here dating back – I think 6,000 years, <laughs> which is just wild, man. So people, this is one of the oldest winemaking cultures in the world, which is something to think about. Yeah. Um, ah, for once I waited for you. Ah, love Mencia. Thank you, Pedro Colon. Good to see that you're doing this. Um, look at this is, this is kind of wild, you know? All right. Yeah, these are. This is this is interesting. So this is an excavated site in the the um, the Azor here of old like. Uh, well, in Georgia they call these kivari, which are like like. Um, uh, they're they're jars that they're basically earthenware jars that people used to make and store wine in crazy man yeah this is you know amphora that's 6100 years old um We should taste the wine because I don't have a whole lot to add to this beyond, you know, I grew up with a bunch of Armenian friends, but nobody was drinking wine. There's a huge Armenian expat community in Racine. 
And there's an Armenian Orthodox Church there too. When we were setting this up, Dan and I, um, Dan was really excited about this wine um, because it's really, it, it, it's, you know, Paul Hobbs coming to Armenia and, and recognizing the potential of this is like uh, synthesizing this super, super ancient, you know, this really, really ancient wine, wine culture with, uh, with, with an American guy who's world renowned for being one of the, one of the great winemakers. And, um, I don't want to say, you know, it, it's so odd when we say, oh, this person's putting this thing on the map or, um, you know, yada, yada, yada. But um, I think for Americans, sometimes it takes validity for us to, um, you, you know, like it, it's he's really putting a stamp of approval on this as a place that he's investing in and, and really had um, – has been ahead of the curve, especially with wines from South America. Wait till we get to that. That's the old man. The, the, his wines are kind of mind blowers. Yeah. There's a lot of comments about how the wine has, when we smell this, like I definitely, it's definitely got a, a very classic, like re, it has a cool climate appearance to the wine. If everybody looks at this and um, by cool climate, I mean, when we look at this wine, we see that it's red in color and it has some transparency. It's trans, it's translucent. We can see through this. I can see my fingers through this and I've got about a two ounce pour for this, you know, very heavy tannic red wines won't happen. That won't happen. And wines um, that have low um, and have low acid, um, you know, and a high pH will have more of a purple hue than this. So it, it shows me that this is a wine from a relatively cool climate, even before I drink it. There's some interesting uh, comments here, you know, uh, taste, you know, Ted and Andrea say, oh, this tastes very European, light texture. Um, yeah, it, it's definitely has a color that would show me like that this wine is not from somewhere warm. It has a moderate alcohol, though. I mean, this isn't like – it's not like it's a – it's 14 – actually, it's pretty high. It's 14.5% alcohol at the same time. I get like a – when I – and I'm going to do this because I, I guess, you know, like, I don't know. I always feel like I, I, I have to. You know, sorry if, sorry if I'll just use the subjective terms for the wine. Um, I get like a – a rhubarb meets bay leaf and a slightly like hay, hay character to it too. But there's also like classic, you know, basic cherry kind of dried strawberry things happening with too. It's, it's, it's like, to me, it's like all red fruit. Yeah. We were talking about this before and, and how the wine was somewhat reminiscent of like Chateau Neuf de Pot because it, it has this acidity, this combination of relatively high alcohol, but like like um, acidity that we associate with cooler climates and dry, you know, and um, European wines specifically. Dory, Dory is commenting that, um, you know, Ted and Andrew said it's juicy and Dory's like, I would otherwise guess a red blend from Europe. Um, oh, you know what? And here Dan is, do I have the link? Hold on. Oh, jumping on now. Okay. Hold on guys. I'm going to see if we can get Dan up here. Cause here he is. Um, he was having some computer issues. All right. Um, do I have the link? It is in your Gmail, right, Eric? Yeah. Man. 2020 strikes again. <laughs> so Dan's going to get on this, and then we're probably going to take this back. And I hope, man, I hope he doesn't see that uh how bad i messed this up what should we do here eric sorry everybody out there in tv land we're gonna we're gonna try to get him live 
How do we... We're probably going to pause this just for a second. Oh, boy. He said it's not in his Gmail. Hmm. We're going to be right back. Oh, look at you, man. Eric's doing this. Can you see the PowerPoint, Dan? Okay. So, do you want me to... I kind of went through that. You want me to just take it back? Yeah. No, there's 32 people watching. It's kind of... It's like live, dude. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude. Okay. All right. I'll go back a little bit. I'll go back a little bit and we can, I'll get back to the cave and like the Jacobian family and stuff. Okay. Way cool. All right, is that? All right, where do you want? Why don't we take it from here? Wait, how did we lose him? Yeah, that's totally fine. Now we don't have you visually here. I'm, oh, me? Yeah. Okay. Oh, Eric's, Eric's, you don't know what to do? Okay. Yeah, why don't you take, I can talk over it if you want to just, if you want to continue the vision.
That sounds good. That work? Okay. So, all right. Everybody, we've got Dan on audio now. Oops. Way cool. All right. Hey, everyone. Okay. I'm sorry for being a little party here. Yeah. Uh, my computer is now juiced up and ready to rock and roll. Uh, you should be all looking at this screenshot that has the uh, the Yakubian Hobbs uh, logo and the mountains in the background. Is that correct? Um, now we are. Yep. Oh, perfect. Yeah, this was this was really fun because we'll kind of start at this point for the Yakubians, but that's Mount Ararat in the background, and you know this is one of the highest you know altitude areas in this Middle Eastern corridor. So. What inspired Paul um, coming out to this area was the elevation, and mm. you know we're going to get to um, a, a wine in the in the near future here. But you know it's from Argentina, and they have a lot in common, especially with this type of elevation, snow-capped areas, high uh, ultraviolet sun rays, which affects viticulture in a very interesting area uh, in, in way. So when Paul stepped foot here, there's a lot of overlap. And for that reason, the viticulture is very similar. Um, it is a pretty robust continental climate. It's a lot of snow and it can be very dry and rocky and kind of a stereotypical Middle Eastern kind of climate, if you will. But it's, um, it's, it's fairly remote and there's not a lot out there and it's a little desolate too. So getting equipment, getting people, et cetera, it was a really big undertaking for this entire area. And let's meet on the next slide. Let's go ahead and meet the other two guys. This is the Yakubian uh, brothers here, essentially. These guys do um, just a, an incredible job with both the marketing and also a little bit of the research because they are heavily vested into the landscape. Um, Paul, you know, the story, the background of these two guys is crazy. They were having dinner in Los Angeles. They were eating at Spago in Beverly Hills. And this is circa 2003. They ordered a Paul Hobbs Pinot at dinner, and at the time, there was a phone number on the cork. And so when they drunk the Pinot Noir, they loved it, and they kind of thought to themselves, you know, this sounds like you know, a, a good wine. This tastes like a good wine. We should probably call this guy and see if he can consult for us. And, and literally, that's what happened. Um, Viking and Bahe uh, in the picture here ended up calling the phone number. Paul picked up. They had asked him if he would like to entertain this idea about going to Armenia, and it, it took a couple of years. Let's just say it wasn't a it wasn't an obvious yes over the phone. <laughs> they really kind of yeah, courted this guy forever, and uh, finally by 2005, Paul had um, you know stepped foot in in Armenia. So you know a lot of um, a, a lot of try and effort on their behalf. But these two guys, honestly, they're really savvy on wine. I mean, they're their families were essentially in that kind of Lebanese in the Becca Valley area. And they grew up tasting some of the great wines in Terrell and in Casada, um, you know, Chateau Moussard is another great one in Lebanese culture as well. So there's quite a bit of good influence with wines. So they had some land. Um, their great, I think their grandparents had fled the genocide in Armenia to America. So they had been born and raised and they had a grocery store business in Los Angeles. That's why they're there. So anyway, it's just a crazy story about who's going where and doing what, but they wanted to do something back in their native lands in Armenia. And it just so happens that a catalyst would be a bottle of wine ordered over dinner. And the, kind of the rest is history. And I will say, on a, on a side note, Nate, this is pretty cool. There was a very famous dinner in Napa Valley. And this was, I want to say this was before the brothers called Paul. Okay, so this is right before 2003. And it was Warren Warninski, who is a Chicago native, uh, ironically enough. But mm -hmm. he's also the owner of uh, Stag's Leap Wine Cellars. Cellars, right? Yep. Totally, totally. Now, he retires. He sold his uh, firm out to, what was it, the Antonori family because they're part of the owners now. And on his big retirement dinner, uh, Warren invites, I don't know, like 50 cats, right? 50 of the coolest wine guys, all friends and family, big to-dos to a big gala. It was going to be a dinner in his honor and celebrate his career. And everyone's pulling corks, man, like ripping some really cool wines, having a great old time. And at the very end of the dinner, everyone's seated, big, long, rectangular table. Warren passes around his chalice of wine for everybody. And everyone, like, takes a sip. They all get a little sample. And it turns out it was a Remy. Oh, and wow. 
when Warren made a, a speech about this, he goes, you know, we've been in the wine industry for all of our lives. All of you are very well respected with regards to what you do and, you know, on and on and on. So Paul recants the story to me and he says, you know, Warren had said, how are you guys ever going to know where to go if you don't know where we came from? And he says, in the glass is the very first grape that we can, you know, kind of like DNA pinpoint called Areni. And he goes, it's over 6,000 years old, it's grown in Armenia. And no one had ever, you know, heard or tasted this stuff probably before. And so Paul's first experience of this grape variety came at behest of Warren Winarski and this dinner at Stag's Leap. So yeah. anyway, wow, wow. Even, even though the brothers kind of had this whole dinner thing and they called him up, he wasn't quite, quite kind of sold just yet. But it's funny how, you know, um, the world kind of works in mysterious ways. So, you know, fast forward throughout the years, Paul's landing now in Armenia, talking to these guys. He's got a great head in his shoulders. And I think the project from that standpoint just gets more and more and more interesting. And so that's really what drove him to do this was that original dinner. Um, if you go to the next slide, as a matter of fact, you know, this is just a little bit about where we're at. It's relatively boring. I won't try to uh, give a big history lesson, but I will say that, you know, Armenia tucked in between some very interesting areas of our world. I, most touched, of on which, I touched on it a little bit and alluded to the yeah. Turkey genocide thing and a little, a little totally. bit. Totally. Yeah, but for sure. Well, you know what, what, how we get wine in and out is this wine goes from Armenia to Georgia, Georgia to Hungary, from Hungary to France, and then from France to the United States of America. And that's how we get wine and equipment in and out, which is crazy. So the uh, the supply chain, we need, to, we need some help in supply chain management. Anyone out there? <laughs> All right, when you go to the next slide here, this is kind of fun, but it's a, it's a relatively um, you know uh, good image that's recurrent. Um, as you can see here, there's very little nightlife you're not going to go to the club <laughs> in, in disco all night long. I doubt there's going to be bottle service, um, but it's drop dead gorgeous. You know, you're looking at probably a population of around 150. There's only a certain number of villagers even here. Um, and, and kind of Paul falls in love with it because of that aspect. It's remote. Everyone is so thoughtful and genuine. And when he began this operation, he got a lot of support from the locals um, and he's teaching them how to farm, you know, so that's pretty the cool, the cool part about it. And, you know, the next slide is, is really why we're all here, this cave that was discovered by 07. So essentially what's happening is though the cave is discovered, no one really kind of understands what's in it for several years. Um, and that was the exciting part. And behind the scenes, Paul is working in conjunction with these guys um, to do this vineyard. And so it's happening parallel. It's happening simultaneously. And I think that's a fun part about the storyline too is that you know it's not that one drew the other but just the fact that they're both you know paul and these you know um archaeologists are working almost tandemly and they're discovering stuff all the time paul's lowing you know putting down new roots the locals are teaching him about historically what they've gotten from already um it's just really kind of a, a fun part about it this picture doesn't do justice but that cave is gigantic i mean it's a huge opening um, and you can see the next slide here too. This is a little bit of reference for size of a person that would fit through oh, wow. and all the things that they have discovered inside here. So I'll walk you through a little bit about the next slide, which is kind of the pits and the shoe and the, and the actual um, uh, kind of, I don't know if you can call these queveries, what they would call locally, but <laughs> these little amphoras. I, you know, I referred to them as 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 quevery like. All right. th there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Spot on, man. Spot on. Yeah. So we see, you know, a lot of people also ask me too, is like, why don't we see people from Napa or other areas of the world using a lot of clay pots? So let me just kind of break this down. Number one, um, you know, working with clay is extremely tedious, right? It's it's raw ingredients, so it doesn't cost you a dime if you have a lot of clay in your given area. But think about what happens after you make the vessel is you have to find a kiln big enough to fire it, right? And that can be very cumbersome and there's not a lot of those set up. So if you wanted to make a big one, for instance, to do, I don't know, a thousand case production or a 5,000 case production, or you wanted to actually make enough to sell globally, 
you know, you have to scale that to some capacity and that's very, very difficult. These ones here, obviously between 14 and 15 gallons, it's not that big, but you're not going to get global distribution. I mean, no one's really going to be buying these wines outside of your, your local village. So yeah, man. We always, we always forget like how the barrel really revolutionized the wine industry and it's only like 1500 years old or so it made things absolutely infinitely easier to to move around in great distances in a way that it was less likely to be spoiled or broken <laughs> right yeah and you can roll a barrel right yeah yeah can't roll pots you know those clay pots if they break they break and then everything's lost so once they put them in the ground uh the ground is basically an insulator so keep the fermentation temperatures just about perfect um, and of course, you're looking at white wine temperatures on fermentation somewhere between 60 and 75 degrees and red wine gets a little warmer sometimes, but the ground would keep it absolutely perfect and usually give you a lot of aromatics because of that. Cooler temperatures build better aromatics. Hot and fast fermentations are usually a little bit taboo. We don't like those as much, but there are some famous wineries that do utilize them. But anyway, so the earth is kind of cool like that. I think that, um, you know, it's a very interesting way to look at fermenting wines. I, I chose the shoe, which is a real picture of the shoe they discovered some years later, um, which had residue of grapes on the bottom of it. Oh, wow. So that's why if everybody I, can see that, the shoe is the, this is on the, the kind of bottom right here. This is like a shoe. I didn't even realize it was a shoe until you told me, dude. Yeah, it's yeah. the oldest shoe on the on the face of the planet, dude. What? Seriously, it, it's, honestly, it's in the record books. It's the oldest shoe in history. Wow! So it costs more than Louboutins, but I mean, they look they don't look as comfortable. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, you, what we, what we knew about this, right? What the archaeologists knew about this was that they're crushing or they're walking or treading on grapes. They're using gravity to fill these. Uh, pits that are basically lined containers and then what we also discovered inside here was a a bunch of like skulls so we saw some some human remains and the interesting part about that is we don't we can't really say for certainty of course that people were drinking wines in you know 5000 bc to get drunk it, there that wasn't a thing right sure. so what more than likely we seen historically was that the um, the burial plots for either elders or kings, queens, nobility, et cetera, would be buried with uh, things to take to the afterlife. Mm. So we th people think, um, you know, not just archaeologists, but you know, all sorts of sociologists and all the great anthropologists think that this area was a burial plot. It housed some VIPs. And because of that, they were giving them things to take with them to afterlife. That that tribal mentality of somehow taking something with you. We didn't know the finality of life in a way. Uh, still don't. But then again, you know, spiritually, what this really looks like. So this is a fascinating dig, quite right. frankly. I call it's, it Indiana Jones <laughs> of our our wine world right now. Well, it's like the caucus version of the pyramids. Totally, yeah. it, it's so cool, right? And on the next slide, you'll see where we get the label inspiration, right? This is actually a pot that was found um, in the um, the burial area. And, you know, what they're doing is carbon dating, yes, um, radioactive isotopes that will carry through um, all sorts of DNA material and DNA-like material. Um, we got a, there's a, or should I say, the Yucubian family got a local Armenian designer to try to transcribe this logo. And so far, um, you know, the anthropology kind of people that are looking at this think this is not decorative. They actually believe that this could be something more of a calendar with mm. the lines and the dots. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm oh. in agreement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, and that was like an interesting idea is that, you know, we look at it and might say, oh, it's pretty. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, back in that era, no one did things for pretty. <laughs> you know, no one gave a shit. Um, pardon my French, but you know this this could very well have been some form of calendar kind of thing regards to when and where or something to that endeavor, which is kind of crazy to think about. So um, it's just fascinating. So when they when they scrape these things, how do we get to a Rennie? Well, we get to a Rennie because they match up DNA wise. What's mm -hmm. inside the pot 
actually matches the grape that's been grown outside the cave. And, and that's the, the cool part about it. And so, so far, um, we have a, a DNA match on the variety. We know it's been cultivated here forever, and it hasn't changed. If you think about the mutation of grape, like Pinot Noir, right? It mm -hmm. mutates to Pinot Grigio or Pinot Gris by shedding the dark color mm -hmm. and becoming a white wine kind of thing. You know, grapes have that very um, high proclivity to mutate. And in this case, Arbeni has stayed relatively uncrossbred or diluted in any way. It's still in Armenia, which is bananas. Uh, and from that point on is where I, on the next slide is kind of where I think to myself, well, why does this all matter? Like why? And, and, and that's the, the cool part is because we are learning about our ancient winemaking brethren and our stories that really have carried through. If you think about it through Noah's Ark, Noah lands the Ark in what's kind of modern day kind of Turkey throughout that, the footsteps of Mount Ararat. We know that he brought vines with him, so the story goes. And you could make a, a, a very logical connection that viticulture has existed in this in this bed of this cradle of civilization for thousands of years. Now, I would say that the old world of Europe had made it a little more kind of prestigious and um, coveted, but in this case, I love the idea of the three ancient world, old world, and new world because it is an ancient world of vine viticulture. And I think that is so fascinating and interesting. And we don't get, um, I don't know, it's not every day, I should say, that you get to drink one, number one, or the story behind it. And it's currently happening. It's actually right now, which is fascinating too. So we're still discovering things about this wine industry that we hadn't once already known. Yeah, it's wild. I mean, we I guess I guess we so much associate, you know, old world wine traditions stemming from, you know, G Greece and and Roman cultures and that being the progenitor of, you know, vinifera grapes in western Europe, you know, and this this massively predates that. <laughs> totally. Yeah, you know, wow. <laughs> and wow. here's another girl. Go to the next slide, Eric, too. So this is what I love as well mm -hmm. is that, you know, so now we've got this ancient thing, right? What did we do with it? Okay. Well, I'll tell you exactly what we did with it. We didn't do anything. We just yeah. made red wine from it. There's no oak on this. There's no other flavor enhancers, so to speak. And it's also clean because I think without getting dorky into flawed wines or pretanomyces or any type of, right? It's, it's clean. So what you taste in the glass is completely indicative of what a Rennie would taste like, mm. okay? It is this interesting ruby medium pale color. And for me, it's always this red fruit characteristic of like that cherry raspberry. And then there's this herbal kick about the wine, which I think is just awesome. Um, and if anyone's picking up on black peppercorn or spice characteristics, that is a definitely a thing because we do see some, some DNA matching here to other great varieties that we commonly know, uh, for instance, Syrah and Sangiovese. So we know that there is a rotundone or um, sesquine terpene chemical that's that's in here that resonates with Syrah fans and Sangiovese fans. Yeah. Rotodone so, is like the thing that makes black pepper taste like black pepper. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And it's also it's not found in um Sashwan peppercorns, which is kind of interesting. I think white pepper doesn't have it either. It's only in black and I think green peppercorns it has that oh, wow. that that turpin. So anyway this is just wild, man. So what you get is this not black fruit, but red fruited wine. It's lower in tannin. It's a little bit higher in um, spice and, alk and uh, acids. Um, and it's just kind of a very soft, pleasing kind of wine. We don't put any oak on it and we kind of make it in this raw state. So um, that's kind of the fun part about it. I think that it, it, it still holds very true to its origin, which is really um, high elevation and you know all that kind of fun stuff. This one in particular, the, the mountain range at Ararat goes to 7,000 plus. This particular vineyard where we're right outside the cave is just about eh, 4,000 feet, which is oh, pretty, pretty severe. It's pretty high up, man. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, somebody, we stainless steel. hey, Dan, somebody asked yeah. who the painter, who was the painter of the yellow baby. <laughs> I don't know. We don't, we don't know. Meme. Okay. Yeah. 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 Famous we meme from like the why though thing, which I, I, I don't know. I'm just trying to get clever. Yeah. That's a good question. And then also there's, the, there's also the question, has the grape undergone significant genetic change in 6,000 years then? Question mark. So no, we, we no. haven't seen oh. that uh, mutate, but the, the argument could be made this, and I'll argue against myself. So in the local village of Armenia, we have not, we still find it as Areni, right? Very true, very kind of like matched and not crossed or, um, or, or, or kind of weirdly breeded off. However, we do see a match with Sangiovese. We see it sharing around 40%, 50% of its DNA with Sangiovese, right? So we think that this happened. We think this grape has always been in the, Medi the Mediterranean, or sorry, the, uh, the Middle Eastern areas, and then viticulture spread through uh, the Mediterranean basin and landed in Italy. And I think that's where the origin starts to link and start right there within the Etruscan and the Roman cultures of Italy. Oh, so wow. what is Sangiovese? Sangiovese is actually an offspring of Areni. Does that make sense? Oh, wild. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That's because nuts. if yeah because we know that the vine was cultivated here before the roman kind of era in as we know it today the modern Tuscan and italian culture with latin so you know they all have to come from somewhere i mean kind of thing like it has to come from somewhere somehow and we think that this happens to be probably the mecca definitely the birthplace wow um, however, if you go to the next slide, this is what we're really excited about for Holton. fingers crossed this year, but I don't know if Jason Wise um, is going to be able to have this out. So the director of the famous Psalm films is doing Psalm 4, and um, it's all about the birthplace of wine. And he films almost exclusively, I think, with inside of Georgia and Armenia. We are in the production for sure, talking about our wines and winery and the Yakubians and, and their influence here. So I'm really hoping this debuts shortly. It was scheduled to go this year, but of course COVID, we couldn't really do a whole lot with the finishing of the movie, but um, we're really kind of eager to see uh, what becomes. And so you can go to his website at psalmtv.com. Uh, he might have some more updates and then hopefully like Netflix and a couple other uh, larger carriers would pick it up for us to view. And even a viewing party would be super rad because it's gonna be this wine is featured, the white wine, and then we make one higher end um, version of the Areni called um, Sarpina. And that's gonna be in it as well. So everything's so, there. Someone's asking, um, you know, are they are clones through the years then? I think the question is, um, y you know, like how did this move and of course, you know, <laughs> there's a pretty big gap in time where these things weren't in written history. But how how does this move from Arini and Vinifera grapes move through, you know, the Caucasus and Western Asia into uh, Eastern Europe, Greece, and then, you know, Italy? And it, I mean, go, uh, go ahead. I don't want to stake the wind out of your sails, bro. <laughs> no, 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 not, not at all. You know, like I wish I had an, an entirely correct answer in this, but it would be either of two ways. Number yeah. one, it would be through the fruit berries themselves and sure. seeds being distributed, which mm -hmm. would be the long road and the, the almost yeah. impossible road yeah. because not every seed is going to be a bearer of fruits. Yep. So an average grape, a grape has about four seeds in it. So you have a 25% chance, one out of four, that one of those seeds would be a DNA match to what's in the grape berry. Mm -hmm. Other than that, growing that's why no one grows from seeds because yep. it's not a guarantee. We do it from science, um, hence him asking, yeah. like, is it clo it, was it clones? Yeah. yeah. But it's not impossible, right? Yeah. It's not impossible. It's seeds, you know, if they're eaten through birds, birds carry it, they fly, they poop, they get somewhere else. And then the next thing you know, you've got a native vineyard, you know, somewhere else. Um, essentially, as long as they can be pollinated, they're self-pollinators too, but there's also pollination problems with some great varieties and species. Now, the other part is to be, yes, somebody had in a vineyard, took clippings and brought them with them, um, which is essentially what happens in South Africa with the, mm -hmm. the arrival of the French Huguenots that made viticulture possible with inside of South Africa. Um, and they're taking, you know, cuttings and re uh, replications of vines and establishing them in 
a basic, you know, native area of South Africa. So there could be one or the other. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, we still, yeah, <laughs> we got, we got what we got now either way, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. If you think about Italy, like if I was going to argue about the, I don't want to get too far off the conversation here, but of course, if you look at Italy, Italy was a Mecca. I mean, it was a trade and barter hub, mm. right? So essentially everything comes it's it's like a moths to light, right? Sure. The city of sure. Rome, yeah. I mean Milan, Rome, Venice, all these areas, they would attract, you know, millions of people that would be trading through vessels and cargo and whatnot. So Yeah, I mean they're Italy, the, they're the absolute vital like economic center of the ancient world. Hundred percent. And so yeah. it, it's it's no wonder why Italy has a I think the most great varieties in the world for one country, over two thousand and five hundred or something native you know, grapevine species inside of, uh, or varietal inside of uh, Italy. So anyway, this is Paul with the family, the winemaking team. And I will just say this, right? Okay, you're hosting Paul Hobbs, okay, uh, right? Uh, 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 okay. Do you think you can get a chair? Yeah, no, it's a cinder block, bro. <laughs> <laughs> totally. But, but that's like what you get. I mean, this is the this is the landscape, man. There's nothing out there. I mean, it's just a very... It's very plebeian for that regard. It's just a very <laughs> natural scene. And Paul loves it. He just loves the genuine aspect of this all. And it's kind of an area lost in time. It's beautiful in that regard. And so anyway, I mean, this is exactly what they would do. They would camp out in the vineyard site. They would break bread and have a little grappa or brandy. There's tons of brandy, of course, in this yeah. area. <laughs> and have a little lunch, you know. And um, So anyway, just really holistic, very, very genuine, good people. Okay, so that's our essentially our ancient world, right? And from there, we have a fun detour where we get to look at, you know, the old world. And this is kind of fun going into a new great variety of crocus, um, which I think is, is, you know, a great lesson in French wines, A, and B, kind of taking some roots from our last story and embedding them into this wine here. Because with crocus, um, you know, this was the family, uh, essentially, the um, the Bertrand uh, and his family that had sought out um, Paul. And, you know, by working with the Melbourne grape forever and a moon, I mean, historically, France in Cahor especially has been growing Melbeck for, gosh, I want to say, oh, uh, what is it, about 800 years? I mean, 12th century, 13th century evil, uh, easy. That gets the name, the Black Wines of Cahors. It dates back to middle, um, kind of the middle ages here. So yes, it's been around forever. And quite frankly, they made very good wines up until um, we had a very robust trade. And if you go to um, the next slide, let's see here. Yeah, the, we'll get to the river in a heartbeat. Go to the next one. So go ahead and taste it because I want you to taste yeah. these wines. While Everybody, yeah, be sure to taste the wine. It's funny. This yeah. this come this has come up a variety of times when talking about Bordeaux and the the Aquitaine and their allegiance and occupation by the English, then made everything east of Bordeaux basically verboten as far as totally. wine to go through the port of Bordeaux. It cost, totally. it was, it was, it was taxed exponentially more and made it, it, it created a disadvantage for the folks that made wine outside of Bordeaux, just to the east to send their wine into any commercial area outside of Southern France. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that is just, that's what happens, right? So a once popular area now gets, you know, the, the treatment, like secondhand treatment and it's, it falls out of fashion. It's um, called a it, tariff, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? We can make a joke yeah, I, about it because we do it now and it's it sucks. And like whether wherever you are in the political spectrum, it's the reality of a tariff when it happens. You know? it, it totally is. Yeah. You know, and, and, and so the Dutch really help out the whole Bordelais process. They are negotiating terms with between French and uh, the English. You have the Hundred Years' War. They come out of it OK. Bordeaux maintains control, of course, through the port. Their wines are light years better. They're blended. They're, uh, there's more terroir, quote unquote, to be had. And these wines are relatively kind of uh, monochromatic, I would imagine, at the time. They're dark and they're hedonistic and they're rich. That's about all they had going for them. 
But, you know, when you clog up the port line with that, you can't really get wines in and out. And for that reason, I think this really kind of fell out of fashion. Um, and then you have phylloxera and you have a couple of severe frost vintages as well. Viticulture has been very, very tough. And of course, we see it. <laughs> look at Napa Valley. Shit, you can't get lucky right now. I mean, you got earthquake, fires, you got everything under the sun. And that's in the modern era. Can you imagine, you know, years ago, it must be very difficult. So. Uh, the point of that is basically that Cahor region, very famous, goes out of fashion. It's basically cahoots. And then, you know, Bordeaux takes over as the uh, the most reputable wine. But there's a reason why Malbec was grown in Bordeaux is because of Cahor. Malbec grew very well to its direct south. And for that reason, it had been planted in the Bordeaux area. Um, and it's always been alive here. Also in Cahor, you find Merlot, which is very common in Bordeaux, of course. So there's a lot of overlap for that reason. And we've always been making really good wine. So let's fast forward, go to the next one here. And we're looking at, you know, essentially, um, there's my point, but there's nowhere for this wine to go. Uh, it's from God knows where, but everyone associates this with Argentina, right? Sure. So every time that we talk about Malbec, you know, we we overlook the the root of this, which is France. We overlook where it's truly from, and I think that historically speaking, there is a type or a style of Malbec from Cahors versus what we're doing in Argentina today, and that's kind of the exciting part. So. He, uh, Gabriel and his team and, and Bertrand learn of Paul's dealings with Malbec in South uh, America. They invite him to go to France. And that is what the L'Atelier means on the very front. It means the workshop. And it was to symbolize the relationship between Paul uh, and Bertrand, which is really cool. And on the next one here, I talk a little bit about, uh, I don't know if this video will play or not. Let's see if it will. But it's a little bit interesting because it, it looks like an EKG meter, you know, uh, the, the river itself is just bananas twisty. And for that reason, the viticulture kind of has this switchback area. And oh, here we go. There's I'm also playing a, the video. Whoa. Yeah. Good it, it, Google it's, Earth it's, skills, Dan. Thank you very much. It, there's the actual winery in the area here at Maison Crocus. And... The interesting part about it, if anyone goes to Napa Valley, there's a very um, famous market called the Oxbow Market. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, uh, Nate. Oh, dude. Um, yeah, the first time I went and was it was in 2006, and my wife had cardamom ice cream. And it's there you go. Like, it's like a Dean and Deluca. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. awesome. And there's a great wine shop in there. It's right by Copia, which closed, so on and so forth. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So guess what? These are all Oxbow bends. You see all these bends where they're almost, they make like a loop almost? There he is. Yeah. That's what Oxbo, that's what an Oxbo bend is, is all those bends. Oh. So that's where that word comes from in Napa Valley. Here where we, here's where we go, folks. We're going to get into why these soils are unique here in just a hot yeah. minute here, guys. Look at yes. that. So this is, so you've got all these vineyards that are abutting the river as the river has carved out these channels. You have hilltops areas, which are on top, that are higher elevation and get maximum exposure in sunlight and usually see a little bit warmer temperature, less botrytis, uh, less type of fog or humidity influences. And then you have some just incredible kind of like um, hillside vineyards. And of course, we would say things like alluvial um, mm -hmm. fans and, um, you know, in these little sloped or um, angled vineyards sites and those would cast shadows as well so the viticulture for this area is is three things it's underripe it's just ripe and it's overripe mm. the Malbec from Cahors sees all three influences of um, ripeness in one area and it's all carved out through the river the viticulture in and the rows are all different angles and different row orientations, which is oh, absolutely wow. bananas. So oh, you get yeah, a lot of, of course, diversity. There's like shadow comes into play here. Yeah. Yes. And like, so from yep. sun, mm -hmm. sunrise and, to sunset, yep. you get a very interesting mix. And of course, there's a variation in soil. So drainage is different in, in the vineyard depending on where you are, too. So absolutely. Yeah. And there's clay 
we were dealing, I guess, in, sorry, Dan, not to, uh, not to paraphrase you. No, but, no. But, you know, we're dealing with like, we're dealing with like what type of soils that retain water. And then we're dealing in alluvial soils that have, that are really good at draining water, plus all these different slopes, you know, um, which right. really changes how, you know, if you're growing the same thing in this place, it's going to, it's going to react very differently from areas just a, a, a few hundred feet away because of the slope and different soil types and, and, and the different, um, you know, exposures to sunlight. It's fat. It's crazy, right. man. Wow. Nate, and Nate, what do we do on in, in, in Bordeaux when we have soils that are either drain or don't drain? So in well-drained soils, we plant Cabernet Sauvignon. In clay soils, we plant Merlot, typically. Boom! Yeah. Boom. But that's, isn't that the thing, right? Yep. So in those, you know, in, in, in a more like, think about like what happened to viticulture. We figured that out. So yeah. we just said, well, we're just going to game the system. We'll put a, we'll put a vine that does better in those conditions. But in this area, they didn't, they just, the whole thing is Malbec, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yep. You really yep. get like what happens on both sides. And I think that's really what builds the, you know, the, the total flavor of this, of this region. If you go to the next slide, you'll see kind of the indication of these classic, you know, terroirs, if you will. So, you know, this area has the plateaus up top, you get different levels of terracing up and down the lot river. And for that reason, there's a huge mixture of soils. You yeah. have everything from Kimmeridgian eras to yeah. Jurassic eras. You've got red and blue clays, which is kind of the interesting uh, next slide, as a matter of fact, which has what I think is the, you know, what, I don't know, most of the cool kids and the Bordeaux kids would say this is the the next kind of like um, hot up and coming region is because of this. So hmm. Boutonniere, which translates the buttonhole and the buttonhole soils of Pomerol is where the famous Chateau Petrus, you have Concevillans, L'Evangile, Gazine. I mean, these are all 200 to $5,000 a bottle, good Merlot and Cabernet Franc from the right bank of Bordeaux. Mm -hmm. Well, it just so happens that there is a lot of the same type of molas, this blue clay, which is very, very rare, even globally. I mean, if you just Google that, it does not, it is mm -hmm. not found, uh, it, you know, a lot of places. And it happens to be in Cahors, which would make sense because it's not that far from Bordeaux, France. So geologically speaking, there is some overlap here. And because of that, I do think that this region has a lot of interesting heart to it. And then for the price of the wine, for what's happening to get to France, to get this quality, you're drinking Malbec still, there is a lot of potential here. And this is why Paul stayed. This is why he wanted to make a project in Cahors that reflects this terroir and this diversity. And also, mind you, a completely different profile of Malbec comparatively to what he's been working with in Argentina. And that is really mm. cool. Yeah, I think, I mean, and everybody, that's the kind of fun thing about doing these virtual tastings is like, hopefully all of you have like a big old, you know, I mean, we got a whole bottle to rip into here. So at some point, I really, really suggest we're probably going to want to taste the two Malbecs in a kind of a side by side, because we're going to be able to, and, and Dan, I'm going to, I'm going to force you into a pigeonhole here, but you're, I'm, well, of course, that's, sorry, I'm mixing metaphors, but I'm going to make you, uh, you know, we'll definitely talk about that contrast, which is so awesome and really gets to the bottom of the concept of terroir and the effect of elevation, soil, exposure, latitude, all these things and how they express themselves through, through grapes and subsequently wine. Exactly. Oops, and I'm losing is, you on the audio here. You good again? Yeah, I'm good. Can you hear me now? Yep, yeah, I can. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and I'm oh. and I'm happy to do so. You won't be able to pigeonhole me. I, I can I can work my way out of this. Uh, <laughs> lot. Oh, somebody's asking what the 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 river's the lot river, and it. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I won't elaborate because I'll start talking about all the rivers in southwestern France. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the Dordogne, the Garonne, the yep. Lot River. The Lot River is very important, and everything flows um, basically inland out to the Atlantic Ocean. Yep. Perfect. Okay. 
Um, so anyway, that kind of finalizes Cohort, and I, I want to just, I'll reiterate that it's a cool project, it's Malbec, it's lost in time, it went out of fashion, we're trying to make it hip and cool again. Um, it was poured at Texom recently, we did a big um, comparison of Cohor wines, and I think this wine in this area has a lot in common with Loire Valley. Oh, sure. Where you know, it's a little bit like it's a little bit backwards in a way, but there's a lot of good potential here. And that lost grape of Malbec is really cool. And we're seeing some very good um, kind of overlap with Bordeaux and winemakers and on and on and on and on. So hey, I think it's really got a lot of potential. Cu yep. Couple of thoughts because I promised somebody we would do this. Just and 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 it's kind of our you, you know you and I professionally we have to geek out on this. What are some food pairing ideas both for the Arini? And the um, and the crocus Malbec. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you asked because I will tell you right off the bat on the Areni, I go two different directions with this. Areni is bomb.com with barbecue. So if you go Carolina or Texas style barbecue, you will not be disappointed because that wine carries that red fruit kind of like a little bit cookie stewed with this you know um, low tannin, good mm -hmm. acidity to it. That wine just this wrecks. That's awesome. Mm. The other flip side of that, if you don't want to go barbecue in nature, um, anything lighter in terms of poultry is absolutely beautiful. And I traditionally, I go salmon to chicken and I'm totally head over heels. The bridging gaps were, because that's just a protein, the bridging components to it, I would say, are things like herbs and things like spices. So if I'm doing salmon, I put down like za'atar spice on top of it or even... Um, uh, things like mace, um, uh, you know, sumac is another really, really cool one that bridges the gap, S-A-U-M-A-C, mm -hmm. and they work really well. And so that's what I love on the Areni. Um, you can kind of get away with a lot of different things, but both work really well. It's very diverse for that reason. And then for the Malbec, for um, Cahors, um, usually it's it's like steak to really robust, bigger flavors. So I like to do game birds to regular steak dish, um, heavy, fatty kind of, you know, meats and such for sure. Cla um, yeah, kind of classic. And then um, do you want to talk a little bit about the, you know, um, reductive slash oxygen sensitive nature of Malbec compared to other varieties and how it ages or you know, <laughs> I will. And I'll say, you yes. know, without getting too nerdy, you know, obviously um, we say a lot of times oxidative, mm -hmm. it just means you got a lot of oxygen. Oxygen can be a very big enemy of winemaking. And for that reason, um, Malbec is very prone to oxygenation. Oxygenation. It's, it, it does not like it in any way, shape or form. And so once they it breaks, of, they it, tend to fall apart after do. being open for more than 24 hours. Whereas like yes. Syrah and Nebbiolo based wines really are, are reductive. That, and that's kind of, that's what I wanted to get to in a nutshell. And then uh, go on, Dan, I'm sorry, I'm stepping on your feet, but. No, you're, to you're yeah. totally right. And so I think for that exact reason, um, you know, in Argentina where it's naturally warmer uh, to some degree, or I should say to some degree, it's, it's freaking warmer uh, in that regard, <laughs> we would like to eliminate the oxygen pickup in any way, shape, or form, whether that's in the vineyard with higher temperatures and roasting the fruit, longer hang times, which would promote a oxidative environment, and in the wine making part of it, just to eliminate um, opportunities that wine is coming into contact with oxygen, which everyone is why we use sulfur dioxide, SO2, in the wine making process, it is a antimicrobial and an anti and an anti um, um, oxygen as well. So it creates a blanket around the wines, keeping them away from oxygen. That's why we use a lot of that in the process. So anyway, uh, that is it. In France, we do see a tendency to make more reductive versions of Cohor, and in Argentina, we seem to make a little bit more oxidative versions of Malbec, and that's changing now thanks to some technology and what we know about you know the processes. But um, yeah, it's a nutshell. You're, you're 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 spot on, Nate. Yeah, and like that crocus, it's we're, we're everybody out there has the the 2016 uh, version of this wine. Um, to me, it, it, it already it's a wine that has uh, out of the gate has a combination of, you know, 
primary fruit and then kind of savory flavors that are just part of its makeup. But um, do you want to speak to like, I mean, that this is a wine for both immediate consumption and to me, like short term aging for maybe another three to five years. Do you totally. think, it could, it, it, you know, if you have uh, think otherwise, feel free to t chime in there, Dan, you're more versed in this than I am. No, it's it's in a great spot. I mean, honestly, you know, we we have a new vintage coming out in a little while, but we've always found that this does a does a good benefit from just bottle aging and not barrel aging. So this does not see any any oak whatsoever, and that's kind of cool. So everything that we get out of this wine, we keep in bottle, almost like Brunello, you know, with that kind of like couple years in glass before it gets released, and that's kind of what we've done. So it picks up um, a kind of it, it's almost like. Not, I, and I don't want to say balsamic -y in a bad way, but it almost has that kind of like just starting to fade kind of earthen, you know, um, angle to it. And that's, it's a good thing to see because Malbec can be excessively fruity. It wants to go dark and it wants to go mm -hmm. kind of sweet, fruity very easily. So we try to balance that somehow. And that's kind of like our version of how to get those things in tandem. Beautiful, man. That's that's hefty stuff. <laughs> yeah, it kind of it is rather interesting. I mean, and we make a couple versions of this wine, um, but it, it, in in any case, it does really good. It does carry a good distance in terms of age, and I think your three to five calls like basically perfect. I, I don't think it needs to go much longer, but you are rewarded um, at that kind of four to six year window where and there's fruit and then there's also secondary notes and in, in even tertiary that starts to develop in that glass which are really i think seductive if everybody wants to also please note that um i i put the wines are available through the website um and if you and i and i did pretty massive discounts if you want to buy anything else so so like the crocus malbec's now 17.99 on the website, the Arini is twenty four ninety nine. So they're like that's insane. Uh, yeah, they're really, really. I, I, I really tried to encourage everybody. Um, it'll. Uh, I have a fair amount on hand, but I'll probably be able to fill orders by like uh, Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday morning at the latest. Um, Okay, uh, there is no oak on this. That once again on the Crocus Malbec, zero. Yeah, the first nothing. two wines are like no bois. All right, guys, zero <laughs> of the oaky oak. Okay, nothing. Zip. No trees were harmed in the making of this wine. Not even toothpicks. Okay, not even um, toothpicks. <laughs> there we go, man. So now we're gonna now. Um, uh, you want to do the segue to the Vinicobus? Yeah, so we, that, you know, that's the old world wine, which has a lot of history to it, not nearly as much as the Arrhenie, but then again, it has some good history to it. It has a good, um, you know, storyline in France. And then, of course, <laughs> ironically, the Malbec grape moves here. It comes to Argentina by a presidential uh, mandate order in the 1850s, and they brought with them a lot of things. Argentina was looking to populate itself with um, a horticulturalist and a couple of other individuals that would bring agriculture like items to this landscape and that was not uncommon by any country quite frankly um, and through that transaction they received a ton of french grapes they received chardonnay and merlot and cabernet sauvignon and they received malbec anything that could really be transported over they did have a pretty good swath of there's even some italian grapes because this area was settled by a lot of italian immigrants for a very long time so you see Nebbiolo, in some cases, we see Sangiovese, and even a vineyard that we had purchased recently had Sagrantino de Montelfaco oh, planted true. to it. That's wild. Which is way bananas. So, I mean, you know, there's a lot going on here, which is crazy. And the reason I bring this up is if you think about viticulture for a couple seconds here, you know, Chile is very, very famous, and it definitely shares that California esque coastline where it's more north to south and it's less of an east to west. And the difference of Argentina is obvious. Look at how wide this area is. So you have this huge plain area that um, is, is perfect for a couple things. That's why there's so much beef and cattle in this area. But essentially right down the spine of the Andes is where, you know, famous hiking, summiting, 
um, ski, et cetera. And it's a very high area that's just uh, riddled with peaks. And for that reason, we see two interesting works of viticulture. The Chilean side is so close to the water, it gets much more moisture and it gets much more cold air right off the Pacific. And on the other side into Argentina, it is much more desert. It's wider, it's a little bit higher elevation, but because that wide plain, it stretches out the hot and cold cycles and uh, zones, and we see some very interesting agriculture that's being produced. So on the next slide, I talk eh, oh, ever so, I'm not there, a geologist, there but I can kind one, of do. There is one question, and then we'll do a little Q, we'll do, we'll oh, do some more broad Q&A at the end. But there's a question on the Arini and what you know you think the aging potential for for that is. So that's a great one. I, you know, I my gut tells me about 15 years, and you're going to be like head over heels, cool kid at the party, pulling out this old ancient thing that's still alive and kicking. And I have a bottle of our very first vintage, which was 2014, and I've gone back to it a couple times. And believe it or not, they drink like Chateauneuf to pop. They drink like old Rhone from the South Rhone Valley, Chateauneuf or, you know, um, Givandas. And it has that grenache kind of character to a little bit. And for that reason, when those wines age, they get a little vinous and they get a little earthy and kind of cool. I, I think that is um, a, a, a very good flavor. I, I, I'm not, uh, when I, for instance, when I drink it, I don't think the wine is dead, tired and out of shape. I think the wine's actually getting into its own. So I think it can go a lot longer and we just don't know it yet. Oh, wow. Hey. Yeah, man, I'm feeling good because you showed up late to the party, but our, our, <laughs> I'm our, redeeming no, myself. our notes are really, our notes are really copacetic, bro. <laughs> yes, yes. I Listen, I, I'm giving it to you straight. I, I swear. I mean, this is exactly what I, what I write when I evaluate a wine. I know I get paid to be an employee of Paul Hobbs, but also from just a wine drinking standpoint, this is kind of how I interpret our brands and our wines. And I love it for that reason. I think it has a lot of overlap with Chateauneuf. Oh, beautiful, man. Um, yeah. Well, here's so here's Ramar. So here's essentially, you know, the, the the grape comes over, you know, from uh, from France into Argentina. It's planted. It's got nowhere to really go. And for that, that reason, I think the viticulture was attempted and it was never great. But in its defense, what was popular, what was the driving economic grape variety to grow and to sell internationally was always Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon mm. and Merlot. And for that reason, Malbec never got a fair shot until, you know, enter modern, you know, storyline of Melbic in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. And that's where we see it. So we poured for you the 17. This bad boy is called Bramare, which actually is an Etruscan word uh, coming from the Italian culture to yearn, to want, to desire, essentially. And so Bramare was something that they would use um, in, in our winery that we wanted to aspire. We, we yearn to make a quality Malbec because for years it was poopy and no one was making good Malbec and nobody wanted to farm it. Nobody wanted to touch it. Mm. Um, and I think even I might have a good uh let's see here no i didn't include a picture um anyway there's a great picture i have of paul in argentina okay when he arrives there in 1988 so i was just a, a wee lad and in the picture it's him and a bunch of guys at catena and they're drinking chardonnay uh -huh. and that was that was the photo op okay uh -huh. that was like the uh -huh. famous pose for a photo uh -huh. and they weren't even drinking malbec malbec wasn't even a thing like no one wanted that and there's a couple of great books you can get to about the history of this that that say the same exact thing. Malbec never really became popular until the mid '90s when Spectator releases its article "Don't Cry for Me, Argentina," right? Uh -huh. And it's all about this new kind of hey, has anyone ever tried this Malbec stuff before? And everyone's like, yeah, it's great. It's like ten bucks. I mean, how can you go wrong? <laughs> Anyway, for me, when I look at this, my notes here, aroma, color, palette, et cetera, they're always big. You know, it's a sweet and sour plum. It's got a little bit of that bay leaf kind of black licorice character. But for, for, for lack of a better description, the wine is, you know, full throttle. It's got a lot of body and texture to it comparatively like Pinot or something like that, even Zinfandel in some cases. It's also um, funny so because before you jumped on, I took the Arini and really kind of stressed the – the higher acidity and the red hue of the wine. And now we look at this and we know how there's much more of a, of a purple, you know, of a purple kind of color, color to it too. 
you know, yeah. just kind of giving you visual cues uh, of the way a wine can taste even before we even before we have it, you know? Yes. Generally speaking, Nate, anything high acid usually does not have purple. Exactly. You can this tell is exactly the thing I was yeah, alluding to. Yeah. Anything purple usually has lower acid and therefore maybe a sweeter fruit profile to it, more kind of, you know, fruit character. But if you look at great Nebbiolo from Piedmont, Italy, and if you look at great Sangiovese, those are all high acid varietals. And if you look at them in the glass, they are red, like brick red, you know. Man. Or and, even orange before you think they and, should be going orange. <laughs> ooh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That orange. And we, we think chemically there's a couple things happening where the acid level is buffering the ability for the color to draw into the fluid. Oh, so wow. it almost works like a stopgap because the acids are just creating that buffering uh, mechanism between the extraction of the wine. And so that would make a lot of sense. That's also why I do think, and it is, of course, that a Rennie has a natural proclivity to have that higher acid content mm -hmm. and thus, you know, has that Sangio character. So mm -hmm. anyway, it's kind of interesting when you look at visually what a wine can tell you without even tasting it, if you know what you're looking for. And there's your secret cue of the day, listeners, about how to blind taste wine <laughs> accurately. Nice. Um, but yeah, so... You know, this is sweet tannin profile, good lush. It's got that high altitude character to it. It has good acidity, but it's it's too well framed within power of wine. So it's kind of hidden in the backdrop. It's harder to find. And we're coaxing it out of there. But 17 was also a very warm vintage. It was also a very robust, powerful vintage. Tons of good scores across the board, blah, 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 blah. But you won't find this to be a cool or, you know, a wet vintage for sure. It's definitely more robust with fruit and power. Hmm. Wow. Um, I did talk a little bit about Andy's formation. I only bring this up because it's interesting. The plate tectonics that arrive here, you have some basically a subduction of the Nazca into South America. It lifts up everything. And here's what I was referring to between Chile and Argentina. All that cold air from the Pacific Ocean has got nowhere to go because the Andes are very, very close and our Chile is like a sliver. But when it goes up in the atmosphere, it cools and condenses. It comes back down as precipitation or snow. It lands on the mountaintop and then you have the remainder, which is this warm air that comes down off of the, uh, the slopes and into this sunny kind of arid and desert-like climate in Argentina which is why we try to put all the vineyards closer to the Andes Mountains because we want that more cooler influence. Totally. I mean, the city of Mendoza is where it is because it's like the one place where there's any water. Yes, it's protected yeah. and it has water and flow of, yep. of water. And this was all done also by, you know, Italian, I'd say more Roman uh, influence about how to collect all this snow melt and channel the water into the village. And they use this as an irrigation technique to this day, which is so, I don't know, almost archaic. But that was one of the part, the, the hard things about it was that they call this flood irrigation. And there is a lot of flood irrigation used in Argentina to this day. Um, number one, because it's kind of cost effective and it's, it's, it's very like wide. It's not as expensive as drip irrigation, for instance. But we dis when Paul was working with Malbec, he had learned something very interesting, which is that Malbec does not like flood irrigation. And the grape suffers from bloating. So if you have a lot of water and flood type of irrigation, it's going to bloat. And then the, the, the chemistry of the grape between the skins and the juice gets totally out of whack. And I think that's one of the issues with growing it for such a long time where the locals couldn't figure out why they were making kind of poopy wine. It just wasn't very good. And it wasn't until they that Paul really kind of, in conjunction with a couple others, started to clean up the viticulture and, and, and dry farm this, if you will, a little bit more, um, that we saw a better skin to juice ratio. We had better quality uh, within the texture and the flavor of the wine. And then it is born. You know, it starts to get better and better year after year. Beautiful, man. Wow. Yeah. And so that's just a, a landscape of the, the, the Andes that are here. You know, you look at all these little beautiful channels. You can almost see where the water funnels in from them, from the Andes slopes. Vina Cobos is over there, and we have vineyards all throughout the landscape, which is definitely um, interesting to see. And, you know, for that reason, our areas are very difficult. 
to grow because on the next slide, I, I look at the Winkler scale, which essentially is cool climate. Um, you know, regions one and two are about what you'd find in Champagne and uh, in Champagne, France. So they are really cold for that reason, and there's more experimentation with other grapes besides Malbec. But um, we are essentially creating two things here, which we, we learned uh, within our generation, by the way. I mean, this is not like millions of years of knowledge. This is actually very, very recent. And that is this, we can have a cool influenced area, right? From these Andes mountains. But because the elevation is so high, you have a more intense ultraviolet light from the sun. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. This is this this is really cool, guys. Like, like, and it's very much to me one of like the the signatures of Argentine Malbec versus Malbec France. expressed in anywhere else. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. You know, it's like when you go skiing and you take your helmet or mask off or you don't wear one at all and you can get a sunburn in the middle of December or January because you are so high up, right? Go to Denver, Mile High Stadium or whatever they say. <laughs> you know, when you increase that elevation, those sun rays are very, very intense. They are a short wave and um, they will change your skin color instantaneously. And that's the same thing what it's doing to the grape skins. It's changing their color. It wants the grape to mutate through that uh, ultraviolet ray. And worst, as you get worst higher up- sun, Worst sunburn this quasi bald head ever got was a day <laughs> in the Andes, like yeah. less to Mendoza, yep. It was, and I, I, I sunscreened it up and everything, man. Wear a hat up in those mountains, everybody. Totally, and, and that's the, so here's the duality, Nate, which I think is very interesting. So if cold temperatures, like in the Andes, elongate or expand the, growing season in a way, they kind of stymie the ripeness because there's less um, kind of, I don't know, kind of uh, respiration and uh, of the vine. Um, for instance, if you grow wine in Texas and it's hot all the time, the vine's constantly respiring. It's breathing, it's, it's using its nutrients. It's got a high metabolic rate, right? Mm. However, the cold climate is the opposite. However, you're also factoring in that elevation where there's plenty of sunlight. And for that reason, the vine's photosynthesis is working nonstop. It wants to go ahead and use that sunlight as an energy source, as a catalyst to create physiological ripeness. And it's the two working simpatico that is very interesting in terms of what makes this region, I think, very diverse. And I think it's what's making better and better and better and better Malbecs. Because believe best you and me, I mean, shit, 15 years ago, I don't really know if I was wowed necessarily mm. by what sure. Malbecs were, sure. you know, sure. but I will tell you with authority that I have tasted the likes of many a great Malbec in my time, Paul's being one of them, and these wines are delicious in their build. They have structure, they have flavor, they're really good. And I would even say, you know, I, I, I think, you know, for the last seven, eight years too, it's like there's there's great Cabernet coming out of, out of Mendoza, a variety of, of areas within Mendoza too, you know, Amen. I, it's one of the, it's one of the four or five places on the globe that makes extremely high quality Cabernet Sauvignon. Too. There's a famous clone of Cabernet that's called the Mendoza clone. Mm -hmm. And it happens to be in some Bextoffer vineyards in Napa, FYI. Oh wow! I did not. This is this I didn't know. Hey, uh, yeah. what? Just a side note, Eric. Did did we we got the prices changed on the website? Correct. He's gonna he's for everybody out there. Eric's gonna go double. I'm gonna have Eric double check that they're changed on the website because we changed them in the in the POS and store. Do you need any info for me to do that, my man? Okay, he's got it. Okay. Blessings to Eric. He's he's my man. I I refer to him as my minion. Sometimes I call him the kid. <laughs> the The guy is like Ray's <laughs> IT guy, and like nice. Dan, I think Dan and I are both like about forty, we're lucky here, and we're <laughs> you know we kind of screwed this up today. So, right. um, but man, dude, this is a pretty the the guy the guy's PowerPoints on on point, guys. Check this. I got out. some I fun know. ones. So yeah. Eric on on the the Gual Tollery that's up there in the pink. Um, like right now is some really interesting grape. There's some sparkling mm. that some kids are doing out there. Yep. They've got Syrah 
going out there. There's a lot of Semyon and white wine grapes going out there, Riesling. Um, that's like the cool kid area right now. While Tollery is, Ooh, is yeah, definitely Yeah, have home. a crazy Semyon in the store from um, – it's like they're called like Riccatelli or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Why? I mean like the wine is like electric, man. It's – it's it's yeah. It's there's some fun stuff for sure. And so we're discovering that we go a little bit further inland towards those Andes. Um, we got a, a Winkler one over there. I mean, there's some possibilities. Um, so in a short area, you have a lot of diversity, I guess, is the point. And for that reason, there's a little bit more of a Wild West mentality right now to mm. plant some different things and create and, and kind of push the boundaries of what Argentina can do. So I guess my point is there's never been a better time to kind of get into this region than right now. Yeah. There's a really cool MW by the name of Tim Matkin, and he's doing a lot of mm. reviews, even categorized it like Bordeaux with a first growth to fifth growth. And he's doing a lot of good research and, and tasting with some wineries out there as well for quality. So this is a, it doesn't get enough attention. I think it's always been under the umbrella of just Malbec, right? But to your point, Cabernet is doing really well. The white wines are fun. Um, lots of things to discover. And if you're like me and you want to get away from the cold Midwest in January, this is summertime down there. So you can kind of get the one-way flight, hopefully, and, and make a direct pass all the way to Mendoza from, from U.S., and uh, you get the warm weather, and it's a good little stay uh, vacation. Wow! Yeah, man, dude, beautiful stuff, man. This is this is really really cool. I mean, do you want to do you want to touch base a little bit on on Luján de Cuyo versus, you know, you know? Yeah, for sure. You know, the Luján de Cuyo area in the north there is where Mendoza City proper is located. It's definitely been a little bit more of the sandy, um, almost like dried up river bottom soil areas. They're away from the, the, the influence of the Andes, uh, comparably that is. And for that reason, there's just a different kind of feel or even a bit of culture that exists. And, you know, the Uco is generally higher in elevation. It has a little bit more of that cooler influence to it generally. And then also we see a lot more undulation. So some much more peak and valley and kind of a rustic, harder to plant kind of area. Um, and, and that's kind of maybe the, the, the big 30,000 feet elevation differences between the two. Um, you know, I think Lujan had always been a very traditional area to work in. And Uco is definitely kind of the area where everyone's flocking to, to put down some roots and to make some really cool projects. So we've seen a lot more development, I guess I could say, uh, with Uco as of recent. Dude. This is beautiful. Hey, and now my video died, but everybody's got me on audio, so it's good. We're, we're seeing – nobody needs to see my just scary mug anyway, you know. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. the, the one, the one uh, on the next slide that I brought up is kind of like what, what grows together goes together, okay? And oh, yeah. I always like reference, you know, you can get a good look at a steak by you know what. Now, if you go to Argentina – you know, they are, you know, there's steak three times a day. You oh, got totally. steak for breakfast. Yeah, it's just and, like, you, dude, I was on a trip there and there was a woman who was a vegetarian and we were all just like, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you know, it's, right. like, it's like, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. That, you, know, you won't get a salad, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you won't get a salad, but you'll get an empanada and you'll get, you know, some steak three ways. And, and, and that's mm -hmm. kind of fun. But if you, you know, looking at the geography in those pampas that are kind of these fertile grasslands in the area, yeah, you know, had this big cattle surge. And I compare this to what, what where we grow up, man, like here, like in the Midwest here, right? This mm -hmm. is definitely very similar. We have this kind of like, you know, dairy, poultry, grain kind of belt of the middle of the United States. And of course, Nebraska into to Iowa and such, you know, a lot of cattle being raised. And for that exact reason, what do you think these people do? Well, they ended up making a wine that goes with their food. With their food, sure. <laughs> you know, like sure. that was the... If you look yeah. at their, their their consumption rate of not only beef but wine, you know, Chile exports a boatload of wine. Argentina consumes a bunch of wine. So yeah. locally <laughs> speaking, these are people that always have a glass that's, you know, that's full and they're looking for that food and wine pairing. So, you know, when I look at sometimes why a grape is popular or why traditionally we've always done this, I also kind of think about the cuisine and what's going to be found at the dinner table because in – uh, in most countries, I mean, look at Italy and look at France and Spain. I mean, geez, Louise, um, you know, their their style of winemaking was a direct 
correlation between what they grow and what they would eat daily. I mean, hands down. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of cool that there's a, there's a, there's a, a duality there. Oh yeah. Com completely. Um, almost like almost in lockstep in a really cool way. And it makes, you know, folks like you and I have, it, it makes our jobs relatively easy <laughs> in, in that way. If you, once you understand the wines of that region, do you have any other kind of non-conventional, um, ideas for pairing with, with, um, the Brumare and, and what's, what's behind the name Brumare. And then, um, I don't want to, I told people we'd kind of wrap this up around six thirty. No, no, of course. But, this is actually, we're, we're basically done. No yeah. more slide, but I'll kind of get into yeah. that. Um, the Brumare was an Etruscan word. So it's stemming from, from Italy, uh, to yearn, to want, to desire. And then my funnier story is I just think that Paul really liked under the Tuscan sun with, uh, with <laughs> Diane Lang. And, and when she, when she buys that that villa in Italy in the movie, the name of it is called Bermare Villa. And so mm. <laughs> um, there's nice. a good quote about that. And like, anyway, so that's, it's it's in reference in Under the Tuscan Sun movie and book. And then ultimately it does have some etymology in the Etruscan and Italian language. Oh, um, wow. And we, we chose that. So we had Vigna Cobos, uh, which is interesting. Cobos, as a matter of fact, is the middle name of a Spanish um, horticulturist that brought the trees to Argentina and the trees were called the Alamos trees, but that's where Vina Cobos comes from. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, when we have Felino, we make the Ramare and then our flagship wine uh, is the Cobos by Vina Cobos. So that's the real expensive one. Dude. Wow. Great. Um, yeah. So this is, so in conclusion, right? Like, you know, we, we chose these wines for a reason, Nate. And I think there's a lot of good things here between that ancient, old, and new world mentality, Argentina being the new world ter you know, area. And I, I think about the word terroir. And if you haven't heard of this word, then this is a great one for you. Um, terroir is a French term, and it's an all encompassing term that would define um, essentially an area like soil climate, whether it's micro or macro climate, it would encompass the elevation, um, all of the native flora and fauna of the area, the plant life and the animal life kingdoms. It's a word that captures everything. It's a reason why and how we explain that a wine tastes the way it does. But our language in English has no equivalent. And for that reason, terroir is used globally. So if you're talking to Germans about German wine or to you know South Americans about their wines, you, you can always use the word terroir yeah, and everyone sure. knows what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, but I do love the idea that the Andes and the geology of Argentina play an influence. I think that the region itself in um, Armenia plays a gigantic influence in keeping that grape native to its area. I think that terroir exists on all three levels of this wine. And the tricky part is finding it sometimes. Hmm. Which piece of terroir maybe has the most influence into the finalized product? Because hopefully it's not our mankind intervention. Hopefully in great wines, terroir is the product of, of, of natural landscapes and, and kind of uh, that influence. And um, that's where... Do you, oh, go ahead. do you feel like there's some obvious, um, you know, um, variations with, uh, in the, uh, I'm going to use the term, you know, the elevage of this, this versus the crocus? You know, there, there is, because quite frankly, we have made a wine here that is a little bit amplified. Uh -huh. And I do think that that's, it's in part to vintage. I mean, let's not face the 2017 was very generous in that regard. Um, there's oak influence in this wine that's different from the Atelier uh, Crocus Malbec. Yeah, um, I was commenting you, that and that was kind of buried in kind of in some of the com like chat comments I have, like, like that this is the one wine we have that has a little bit of an oak influence. And I, you know. It I, does. Yeah, I mean, yes, it does. In the chats. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, Nate, this is one that has both French and American. Oh, there's a yeah. there's just about ten percent, so just a tenth mm -hmm. of that production. We cycle in a couple of American barrels, which are actually really high quality. Um, I always was one that always thought we should always knock American oak. It was never as good, but this we think adds a very cool dimension of flavor, aromatics, and in such in texture uh, to the wine. So 
yeah, this is very different in that regard. Ironically, it's the same winemaking team. Yeah, you know, totally. It's our, our guys, you know, yeah. we're in conjunction with Bertrand. Yeah, but essentially. I mean, you that's kind of so much fun about this is the side by side is like, I mean, outside yes. of a little bit of wood, we're we're dealing with genetically the same raw material. <laughs> <laughs> you know absolutely I mean? it's and, like a total everyone, nature versus nurture you know like like i mean i yeah. look like ben stein now but you know i didn't go to harvard you know so like my my nurture is different than him you know <laughs> right? yeah i was gonna say you know to people that are uh, you know fortunate to have all three of them in the in the glass tonight um this is kind of cool because they're not the same winery but they're under the guidance of the same winemaking team. It's all Paul at the end of the day and his guys. Yeah. So it's kind of fun to see that a lot of the um, variables in this equation are not drastically different. What we're really, these are all sound, good winemaking practices, good harvest techniques, et cetera. Um, that where they really differ is because I think some terroir influence here. Um, when I taste this wine, I wouldn't say because this wine has oak, it must be from Argentina. That's not true because there's oak in France, of course. I mean, you can get an oaked Malbec from Cahors. So yeah. that that wouldn't be something that I hang my hat on in a blind tasting necessarily, right? Yeah, you know what I mean, I mean and, and this is like, and I guess, I don't know, I guess there's some people that paid the price to hear you and I kind of talk about this stuff. But it's like, it's so interesting to me, like when I think about the effects of, of a, like a, a, a growing season that has way more hours of, of sunlight and like and intense, and, sunlight. And intense sunlight. And that's the, the effect on the flavor profile and the kind of aromatic spectrum that both of these wines occupy. The Bramare is actually lower alcohol than the Crocus. Isn't that bananas? It's crazy, but the Bramare is like all in for all intents and purposes. Your organoleptic experience of this wine is that it's much riper. Dude, massive points for you for yeah. saying organoleptic. I just yeah. had like a that was made my day. My heart just skipped a beat. But <laughs> you, you, I mean, seriously, I mean, they're the, the they're 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 crazy. If you were going to put one, you were going to say, "Hey, what w what has the higher potential for, you know, what's the what was the riper thing when they were harvested?" You yes. put the Brumari hands down, but that's really not the truth, right? And we think there could be a couple reasons why. I won't try to even hypothesize why that could be, but soil could could be a factor. Um, those angles, all those different angles near the Crocus Rivers that were all oxbow bends, there uh -huh. could have been a, a plot that we got that just like got the right angle every single day for, sure. you know, sure. <laughs> April through October yeah, essentially yeah, yeah. and just got to hit hard. I don't, I don't know. It's kind of a the magical thing about why wines taste so dang different. I and, mean, and that's just, that's was really cool when we saw the ex different exposures and vineyard, you know, like variation within us in the vineyard in Kaor, we see like. I mean, the spice rack is pretty broad there, for lack of a better term. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Yes. Which exactly. is something I, 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 mean, think I, I never realized it until then. Whereas, like, I don't want to compare Luhan de Cuyo to being a, a monoculture where the grapes have the same exposure and soil types. But, but, but it's, they do. It's, they, it's less so, dramatic. It, it's less dramatic. You, it's you, you wouldn't be wrong at that. Yeah. I think there's, you know, I, I, I be, I'm critical of it, but I'm not from a, a malicious standpoint. It's just that, yeah, in, in, in some of these areas in Argentina, it is rather um, uninteresting in terms of like how it's sloped or there's no terraces that are carved out by the Romans centuries ago. Um, you know, it's, it's relatively flat, which makes it easier to farm. It makes it a little more unison in how it ripens. And for that reason, it's more homogenous. And, you know, sometimes we look for that as farmers because we want to be guaranteed a crop yeah. or a certain quality. But in areas like you're look, this picture, as a matter of fact, is, is from Les Manil in Champagne, France. But I mean, look at the difference exposures here. Look at the patches of yellows versus browns versus greens. Why would that be? What's underneath them to either hold the moisture, creating the really green, or draining really well to make it more yellow because the synesis of the vine is currently happening there with the yellow. You can you can see it breaking down, losing its water retention, dropping its fruit, bringing to ripeness. 
where do you think the water goes, you know, and collects? It's going to go down. The gravity is going to carry it away. Uh, you know, when that when the sun comes up, do you think those those forests in the background give it shade? You know, like what happens when it casts a shadow? All those type of things. What's what the with the sun block or a wind block? I mean, all these types of crazy little nooks and crannies are what really drive some of those. You know, I think interesting pieces of viticulture. It takes a big spice rack to make Krug, Dan. It certainly does. I tell you that much. <laughs> and it takes a heck of a marketing team to make me want to spend four hundred dollars for it. That's for sure. And, and, and feel like it's justified, right? Which I, I know I that's do. the thing. It's um, yeah. Hey, do you, you like a hard hour last campaign? To, to, so I can play the role MC here. Do you? Um, I'm going to kind of open this up for another about ten minutes for questions. Yeah, with you. you. And if you want to take it off, the, or just, you can stop sharing if you want to, and bring me yeah, on officially. Yeah, I'll, I'll or... wrap this up with folks, and I'll let them chat, and I'll just tell you what the chat questions are. If, yeah, and no then worries. we'll close this out at like, like, you know, five to seven. So, folks, if you want to ask Dan any any questions or anything else about this. Um, uh, then, you know, throw, feel free to, uh, th throw it our way or throw it Dan's way. And I'll, and I'll, I'll play the game of telephone with him. Um, and, and I believe Eric, we, we updated, we update all the prices on the website and did we update oh, the cool. quantities? We set them all like, yeah, okay. He's good. My, my it guys shaking his head. Thank th Hey, thank you to Eric. Man, <laughs> Eric, guy, big you, thanks. My guy was like the pit crew today. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh i know and even when I, when I got on i was like i was like did i which calendar did i save this in i Dude, couldn't even I, find it i don't even know man we're gonna have running. to talk about this uh off off uh, hey and dan fyi man when i do these things and it's live and there's like 40 people i'm like a sailor man it's just it's just, okay it's coming out of me so no no worries was, about i've been relatively good by all yeah, accounts it's I all it's all adult it's all adults here man you okay. know like that's the beauty of booze is like we work with grown-ups you know hey, um yeah New I, oh wait, I, I, new I, I, wines and new I, I, words. Fabulous. Thanks, Nate. Oh, people are uh, people are kind of geeking out on the organoleptic. Yeah. Yes. Uh, organ organoleptic. Anything you can taste, smell, uh, hear, yeah. anything that's native to your sensory. Yeah, um, man. It's you know. it's you it's it's just the the subjective that you're taking in from external st right. stimuli, man. Because there is a difference. For instance, we can take that wine to a laboratory and we can dissect it. Yeah, and then exactly. We can break it down like when we talk about and tartaric create. acid and pH totally. and all, yeah, and totally. all these things, you know, and and that's kind of cool. I mean, even when we look at it, I guess, yeah, yeah, that's the truth. I mean, even our vision of it is visually is a organoleptic experience. It's kind of interesting, and like you know, Dan, I don't know, well, I mean, geez, you know, Dan's a master some, and. You know, but but a lot of the things that he and I are talking about here are things that we both learned through going through the court of master sommeliers and and learning learning about blind tasting too, you know, and using you know organoleptic information to determine uh, you know aspects of wine and using your um, your your, your sense mem your sense your memory. Senses, yeah. And um, I mean, to me, the beauty of wine, like why I'm so passionate about it is um, there. It's so just evocative of of other things. And um, the the um, oh, my God, what I'm what am I trying to I'm trying to grab it. The word is escaping me here. Your um, your memory for things that happened before, you know, I'm in a Proustian kind of way, sure. you know, um, no, it's very true. I mean, I, I kind of, I don't know about you, when I taste wines, I kind of like try to picture, um, if I'm looking for fruit flavors or like descriptors, I just like walk a grocery store in my head. For sure. And I like, I'm entering the Whole Foods and I'm like, all right, I got my citrus over here and I'm looking at all the different citrus. I'm, yeah. Here's all my berry fruits, blueberries and I, and I'm kind of like searching like this wine, where am I at in the grocery store? Am I with the herbs? And the mushrooms over here. Am I with the, mm -hmm. you know, the the citruses? Am I with all the apples and pears? Um, associative, memory, kind of, associative memory. Associative yeah. memory. What I was looking to say. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And then same thing with like my rolodex of you know great varieties and markers. And I'm like, all right, you've got boom, boom, and boom. What does that remind you of? Okay, that's clearly Sanso. Yep. Got yeah. it. Okay. Why is it? And then back it up. You know, make my build my case of evidence, and then say, does it hold water? And then final answer, 
I called it this and I'm wrong and I will forever be humiliated in front of right? my ear. Right. So <laughs> there's a couple questions here. There's, there's the, um, oh, Dan, have you visited any of these vineyards? Yeah, no, I've been to Cohor. I've been to um, Argentina several times and I have not been to Armenia. Okay. Um, uh, maybe for good reason right now. Oh yeah, but It'd be a little, I definitely yeah, want to get out holy there. Holy shit! Like, let's not even go there, okay? Right, um, right. But yeah, I mean, I probably have a you know, uh, maybe a, a family from Racine has like you know can host you there or something. I um, hope so. Yeah, yeah. I'll stay in Erdogan. I mentioned know? this before that there's a really large um, Armenian expat community in Racine where I grew up. In, I know. In, in no, we did a crazy good dinner. Yeah. We did an incredible dinner in yeah. Wisconsin a couple of years ago, and it was well attended. I think two days back to back. Mm -hmm. um, there, there really is, and they should be very proud and mm -hmm. honored uh, of some of the things that they're accomplishing right now with regards to wine production. Um, and it's cool to see people like Paul, too, that are kind of championing that, too, and bringing it to light because it's one thing to have a winery. I mean, it's another thing to try to compete globally in sales world today. Oh, oh my God. God. Forget yeah. about yeah, it. Man. Totally. You, you, they, you see this. You run a damn wine shop. You know how many options you have? Yeah. I brought this up. I said, I said, you know, before you came out, I was like, you know, Paul Hobbs getting involved with Armenia even though it's this ancient wine region, it really validates it to other Americans because he gets to, you know, there's a, there's a synthesis of the branding there. I hate using marketing totally. terms, oh, no, no. but it's real. You know, somebody, it's, it's hold on, somebody, real. somebody says, this is kind of funny. Robert Mangan's like the, the Bramare's real. I'm, I'm only laughing because I love this so much. I don't, don't, don't take it. Don't, it's so fun. No, no, no. It's so good. It's so, it's val. I love this. He's like, the Romari really smells like lasagna to me. Am I crazy? Do I have COVID? And have I lost my sense of smell? I can see like an oregano thing for sure. Totally. It, uh, I, or that cheesy, like maybe that cheesy, leasy thing. Yeah, that the comes cheesy, off leasy thing. I mean, we talk about this a lot. Like like in Somland, cheesy, leasy gets said a lot. Meaning like, <laughs> like yeast in and of itself, in, especially once it's in an anaerobic environment. And then we first open it up, like really yeast can smell like cheese, you know? So maybe I that's mean, it, Bob. Maybe that's it, Bob's man. I'm just hungry. I think Bob's looking for his food pairing right yeah. now. He's like, Malbec Dude, and lasagna. I just, I want to crush some lasagna right now. No um, kidding. I, I like the wines in order, but the Brumari was particularly good, someone says. Brumari was great. Thank you, thank you. But we'll go with the Arini as my favorite. Yeah, I think I, I can see, I get that a lot, quite frankly. Like, it's kind of fun. You know, it's it's like the the marry, kill, and date, for lack of a better. Can I say the F word? It's like marry, yeah. kill, and F1. Like, which one do you like out of the yeah. three? It's like, I don't know. Like, yeah. I kind of, you know. No, no, I, this was fun putting this together. And, like, these are really – I love how, like, like really broadly different these are and, like, how this has got to be fun for Paul because he does, in the end, get to make – really strikingly different wines you know oh for sure another. and i'll take it yeah i'll take it one step further with that comment nate because it's something i didn't touch on earlier which is mm -hmm. you know this is the fun part for our workers because we get to rotate them around the world and they oh. get to see and make wine on different continents yeah. in different countries oh that's wild man. and it's like a if you're in a kitchen and you're just staging in the kitchen, you're learning how to cook with Thomas Keller and Napa, and then you get to go see Pierre Garnier in Paris, then you get to go over here to, you know, go to to Nomad in Copenhagen or somewhere. Mm -hmm. Like the the ability to understand winemaking on a multitude of levels and not just making your Pinot Noir from Russian River Valley year after year after year after year. Yeah. Is really what you know separates the the wheat from the chaff here. I yeah. think that that's really cool. Well, man, this was awesome, and like, if we do this again, we'll 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 start it like on time. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know, dude, dude, it's it's okay, man. We live like I mean, I'm I'm roll, I'm learning to roll with the punches. Eric, Eric, I, I've never I, seen I, Eric. I, I think Eric actually sweated for a moment, and that's the dude. Yeah. He like he's ice cool, man. My guy is like, I mean, if we were a rap group, he would be. He would just be the guy that like drops the hottest verse and just walks away every time, you know. <laughs> I'm the guy that's throwing up in the bathroom before he gets on stage. Yeah. Okay. Um, hey, thank you so much, Dan. This this was like this this way we really staged to come back here. Um, Absolutely. And great no, questions, everybody. Um, and I'm getting really like like really nice fanboy feedback here. You know, I think. Uh, hey, thanks. Um, 
and thanks everybody for coming. I, I, I'm going to, we're going to take a pause with, I've got like one cocktail event coming up, um, next week and th- oh no, no, next Saturday I'm doing a Rhone tasting in the same format. We won't have, you know, it's just plain old certified Sam Nate, who's director of wine and spirits at Ray's doing it. <laughs> um, and I probably won't make a PowerPoint this sexy, but it'll be the same format um, uh, next Saturday, kind of same idea. Um, I've got all those kits available. We're doing another cocktail class. Then I'm going to pause till January and I'm going to put out, uh, I'll, I'll put out a slew of events that'll happen in January. I think, uh, I'll, I'll hit up Dan to do this again. Cause he's got a bevy of really great wines. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, Eric really, Eric and Nate want to go home and I want to eat some lasagna. Bye.